Good afternoon. I'm John Campbell. I'm a philosophy professor in the department here, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Howison Lecture. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, the Howison Lecture is so called because George Holmes no, 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 Howison. No, 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 no. Yes. Robert. Uh huh. Yeah. George Holmes Howison, who was born in 1834, moved to Berkeley uh, at the age of 50. Um, at a time when round here seems to have been mostly farmland and fields, um, he accepted the chair that founded the Department of Philosophy here. Howison was clearly a gregarious and charismatic character with many radical philosophical views on fundamental questions. And on his death, his friends put together a fund to pay for the leading thinkers of the day to come out to the rural backwoods here and um, <laughs> help us keep on the pulse. And I think Holmes would have been, Holmes Howison would have been delighted with our choice of Susan Wolf as this year's uh, Howison lecturer. Wolf has said about her own work, the probably main things I focused on in my career are free will and moral responsibility, the structure of morality, the relation between moral and non-moral values, and meaningfulness in life. I think, as you can tell already, she said that the three things she likes in philosophy are clarity, precision, and big, ambitious questions. No question about that. I mean, the questions she's dealing with are not academic inside baseball questions. They are questions that all of us address insofar as we're human every day. And she's maintained a number of very striking, distinctive philosophical theses. Some few years ago, she wrote an article that began with the unforgettable world, words, I don't know whether there are any moral sense, but if there are, I am glad that neither I nor those about whom I most care are among them. She's argued that freedom should be thought of as the ability to do what one reasonably takes to be the right thing, and she's argued that searching for meaning in life should be differentiated from searching for one's own happiness or the performance of duty. In another memorable phrase, she said, meaning arises when a subjective attraction meets objective attractiveness. Meaning arises when the subject discovers or develops an affinity for one or typically several of the more worthwhile things. Every word of these uh, remarks, of these arresting remarks by Wolf, has generated uh, tons of discussion. She did a BA at Yale in philosophy and maths, a PhD from Princeton, then taught at Harvard, Maryland, and Johns Hopkins. In 2002, uh, she became the Edna J. Curie Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it's just a delight to have her here to share her current thinking. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wolf. Well, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I also want to thank the Howison Committee and the philosophy department and the university uh, for this invitation. It's a great honor to have been invited. Uh, thank you for the weather, which I understand ha ha just turned in time for my visit. Um, and I'm awed by the odd size of the audience today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, right, I'm thinking, you must be here under false pretenses. This is, there, there are too many of you to be at a philosophy lecture without s some misunderstanding. <laughs> Nonetheless, I will do my best. References to character play a role in a great deal of philosophical discussion. The notion of character is fundamental to any study of virtue and vice. It's frequently invoked in discussions of the self, 
and comes up often in conversations about freedom and responsibility. In ethics, Bernard Williams has criticized both Kantian and consequentialist moral theories for failing to recognize the moral and psychological significance of individual characters. And some philosophers, impressed by the findings of situationist psychology, have raised doubts about whether the notion of character has any application at all. But despite the relatively frequent appeals to the notion of character in philosophy, remarkably little attention has been paid to the concept itself. And when philosophers have taken the trouble to define it, they have defined it in different ways. I don't want to legislate or revise ordinary language. Great, thank you. Uh, or to claim that there's a right way to define the notion, much less propose a definition of character with necessary and sufficient conditions. But if it is playing a role in philosophical inquiry, it is important that we understand what we mean by it in its particular context. Although the term is often used broadly to encompass most of a person's psychological traits, there is a narrower and more robust sense of character that I think is relevant to a number of the philosophical issues in discussion of which the word is invoked, but whose difference from the broader and thinner sense tends to go unnoticed. My aim today is to bring out the distinction and to consider how best to understand the more robust sense of the term. If I'm right about the distinction and its relevance to our self-understanding, it will have implications for the way we think about many other concepts, including reason, intelligence, value, and the self. Especially interesting, I think, are the implications of this understanding of character for the way we should come to think about agency and its importance. Specifically, it will imply that agency, in a sense of great significance to us, has less to do with actions and with the will than is typically assumed. The OED lists 15 senses of character, most of them familiar, beginning with a distinctive mark impressed, engraved, or otherwise made on a surface, and ending with an odd, extraordinary, or eccentric person. The sense closest to what interests us here, particularly in connection with an individual's character, is listed as number nine and reads, the sum of the moral and mental qualities which distinguish an individual or a people viewed as a homogenous whole. A person's or group's individuality deriving from environment, culture, experience, etc., mental or moral constitution, personality. Helpful as the OED so often is, however, it neither aims at nor achieves philosophical clarity. And in this case, this allegedly single definition is either inconsistent or ambiguous. For the sum of the moral and mental qualities which distinguish an individual embraces a wider range of features of a person's overall psychology than does the single term personality, or at least so it seems to me. The former presumably would include a catalog of a person's psychological abilities, her level of intelligence, her facility with languages, her poor or excellent memory, as well as any psychological disorders she might have, such as Tourette's sy syndrome or anorexia. But it is unlikely that we would consider these parts of the person's personality. Further, even if personality, which is the narrower of these terms, seems broader than or at least different from the sense of character that I have in mind. For although there are some contexts in which people may comfortably and naturally use character and personality interchangeably, it seems to me that when we're speaking concretely and precisely, we don't use the words personality and character in quite the same way. If you are asked to describe someone, whether yourself or another person, or to answer the question, what is so-and-so like? You may well list features of the person's personality. Of course, it would not be out of place to describe the person's physical characteristics, too. But one of his, if one is asked instead, who is this person really, you're apt to focus on a narrower set of qualities, which, are, which we are more likely to classify as aspects of the person's character. We're more likely to describe someone as having a bubbly personality than a bubbly character, to regard her liking for country music or her taste for bright colors as reflecting her personality 
rather than as a sign of her character. Virtues and vices, on the other hand, are paradigmatic aspects of a person's character. More broadly, we tend to associate a person's character with dispositions and qualities that embody or display that person's values. In general, I would venture to say, we tend to use the term character in connection with features of a person that are regarded as especially important or deep, and to use personality in connection with many of the person's other distinguishing traits. This seems to square well with the use of the term in most philosophical discussions. But since usage varies, and because people differ in any case about which features they regard as especially important or deep, we cannot make too much of ordinary linguistic practice. While my aim is to offer an analysis of character that gives a plausible interpretation of much of our unreflective use of that term, I also want to illuminate some of the uses philosophers have made of it. Specifically, I am interested in understanding character as a term closely related to a person's core identity and as referring to those features that distinguish one person from others in ways that are important at least to people with whom they are or might be in close personal relationships. If one cares about oneself, I want to say, one has reason to care about one's character. And if one cares deeply and personally about someone else, one has reason to care about their character, too. Further, I am inclined to say that insofar as one relates to people as people, insofar as one takes what P.F. Strassen termed the participant stance towards them, one implicitly relates to them as individuals who have characters or who, at the very least, have the capacity to develop characters. But what can the term character mean that will allow me to say all these things? Philosophers and others are apt to regard virtues and vices as aspects of one char one's character, if anything is. More particularly, they often associate character with specifically moral virtues and vices. Peter Goldie, one of the few philosophers who has explicitly proposed a distinction between personality and character, writes that character traits are deeper than personality traits and are concerned with a person's moral worth. And the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's only entry on character is, more specifically, an entry on moral character. But if we're looking for a sense of character that embraces whatever is especially deep, important, and distinctive about a person, which is closely related to a person's core identity, and which embraces those features that distinguish one person from others in ways that are important to their candidacy for, other personal, for close personal relationships, then restricting the range of traits to those that are specifically morally good or bad is too narrow. To be sure, a person's moral qualities are often of great interest to us. And many people, thankfully, do regard their moral values and their commitment to expressing and living in accordance with them as deep and important features of themselves. But to think that this is all that people cherish or despise in themselves, or all that they regard as deep facts about themselves and each other, grossly exaggerates the role moral values play in most people's lives and self-conceptions. Morality itself is, of course, open to narrower and broader construals. Such traits as pretentiousness, arrogance, tactlessness, and self-centeredness are at least broadly moral vices, even if they are strictly compatible with an individual's moral righteousness, since they reflect a person's attitude towards herself relative to others that is in tension with moral ideals. Executive virtues and vices, too, such as courage and cowardice, industriousness and laziness, might also consider at least to be at least broadly relevant to morality because they have significant implications for a person's performance when morally important challenges arise. But even when we interpret morality broadly and generously, the range of qualities that constitute a person's specifically moral character will leave out much that people take to be deep and important aspects of their own characters and much of what matters to us about the characters of others. Speaking for myself, the knowledge that an individual possessed all the moral virtues, or that at any rate she was an exceptionally impressive moral exemplar, would not make me love her or seek her out as a friend, though it would make me admire her. 
for she might, for all that, be boring or humorless. Nor would the fact that a person had significant moral flaws necessarily exclude her from candidacy for such relationships. People might reasonably pride themselves and be prized by others for their adventurous spirit, their intellectual curiosity, their passionate engagement with nature or the arts. This suggests that a definition of character that relates it to reflections of a person's values generally and not only or especially to the person's moral values will get closer to the sense of the term we are after. An interpretation of character as especially connected to a person's values also makes sense of Bernard Williams' use of character and of many philosophers' identification of a, of a person's character with their real self. Williams' use of character seems to identify a person's character with their ground projects, or at least to regard their ground projects as comprising an especially important part of their character. And by ground projects, Williams refers to those activities or relationships that are closely related to a person's existence and which, to a significant degree, give a meaning to his life. A person's relationship to her children or to her career or to a non-professional interest about which she is passionate might thus count as among her ground projects in Williams's sense, as important to her sense and perhaps other sense of who she is and of her reasons to live as anything. Much as I support Williams' emphasis on the importance of a person's ground projects to moral psychology and moral theory, however, and loathe as I am to disagree with anything Williams says, I confess that I find his use of character linguistically odd and unfortunate. Indeed, it seems a misuse of language to say that when a person loses one of her ground projects, say her beloved partner dies in a plane crash or her carpal tunnel syndrome ends her career as a violinist, her character necessarily changes. The fact that she had these ground projects rather than some others, that she had them in the specific ways in which she did, and that she responds in the particular ways she does to their loss, do typically reflect her character. And indeed, the loss of one of these ground projects may, depending on the details, lead gradually to a change in character. But they are not themselves parts of her character. Still, if we think of character roughly as those dispositions and traits that reflect and express an individual's values, then the fact that our ground projects do reflect and express our values allows us at least to connect a person's ground projects with character in a way that conforms better to ordinary language. This use of character also fits well with the tendency among philosophers to identify a person's character with her real self and to identify her real self, in turn, with those aspects of herself with which she identifies and which she either does or would, on reflection, endorse. For on at least one familiar way of understanding what it is for someone to value something, valuing is connected precisely to identification and reflective endorsement. Useful as it may be to have a term for such a concept, however, I do not think it succeeds in capturing enough of our ordinary linguistic practices to be a good definition of character. Nor will it do if we want to retain the connection between a person's character and what we regard as deep and important about the person. In one respect, I believe this characterization of character is insufficiently specific. In another, I believe it is too narrow. Let me begin with the latter. One natural way to understand the proposal to understand character as composed of those traits that reflect a person's values is by thinking of character as simply consisting in an individual's values or valuational system together with those behavioral and emotional dispositions that reflect and express them. But on this view, it appears that a person's character can include only aspects of herself of which she approves. This seems clearly wrong, since vices and other character flaws are as much a part of someone's character as virtues and other admirable character traits. And although there are some cases in which what we regard as a vice is endorsed by the person who possesses it, think, for example, of Gordon Gekko's comment, greed is good, or of Ayn Rand's doctrine of objectivism, 
There are many others in which a person whom we correctly judge to be, say, selfish or arrogant or racist would agree with our assessment that such qualities are to be condemned. Such a person may not recognize these character traits in herself, and if she did, she may not endorse them. But disavowing a character trait does not make it disappear. The range of forms of racism, sexism, and other sorts of prejudice and bias that are aspects of people's characters may be particularly resistant to an analysis that links all character traits to reflections of a person's values. Admittedly, there are unapologetic racist, sexist, and bigots of other sorts, people who not only regard one ethnic group or gender, say, as intrinsically superior to another, but who are at least privately unashamed of this. But there are many other forms of racism and sexism that are harder to classify. Even some very blatant types of prejudice are not easily interpreted as reflections of a person's values. There's clearly something wrong with the person who says sincerely, I'm not a racist, it's just a fact that blacks are statistically less intelligent than whites, or I'm not a sexist, I just believe that women should be women and men should be men. But is what's wrong a matter of their values? If we understand values to involve an actual or hypothetical judgment that the object of value is good, it's not obvious to me what values such racist or sexist remarks reveal. Furthermore, people frequently value or disvalue features in each other that the person herself doesn't even realize she has. And she may have no opinion at all about the value either of her possession of those features or of the objects on which they focus. One may be charmed by another's lack of awareness of her own beauty or brilliance, for example, or by a person's unselfconscious quirkiness. Or consider someone with a philosophical turn of mind whose interest and enthusiasm for certain kinds of questions and conversations, whose reactions to novels, plays, and current events reflect a tendency to approach and respond to the world with a particular kind of intellectual curiosity. Those of us who one way or another came to recognize this as an interest in philosophy, who went on to major in that subject, to seek out philosophy lectures and books, or even to become professional and academic philosophers, presumably do value philosophy and our relationship to it. But we can easily imagine someone who never knew that the sorts of questions he liked to contemplate were philosophical ones, who never realized, in fact, that there were particular sorts of questions he was interested in that set him apart from others, though he may have noticed that people sometimes looked at him funny and found him a little weird. It seems to me that having a philosophical turn of mind is a quintessential example of an aspect of someone's character, a deep and distinctive feature of a person that could be important to what attracts or repels us from him. But to insist that it reveals the person's values, if values are to be linked to what a person does or would under ideal conditions endorse, is to project something onto his psychology that may not be there. I do not just mean that he may not value philosophy or his propensity to ponder philosophical questions under those particular descriptions, since he doesn't even know what philosophy is. I mean further that it would be unwarranted to assume that he has even a disposition to value it on reflection, should it be pointed out to him. His attitude towards his philosophical turn of mind might simply be indeterminate. Further, it seems to me that this example is an illustration of a tremendously common phenomenon. We know some things about our own characters and are probably self-deceived about some others, like the well-known tendency of people to rate themselves as better drivers than they really are. Most of us probably also be believe ourselves to have better characters than we actually have. But equally, there's much about our characters that we are simply unaware of, features of our psychology that are so much a part of us that they're part of the background that shapes the way we see and respond to the world without ever being an object of our perception itself. Such features need be neither good nor bad, such as having a philosophical turn of mind, but they may well contribute to one's distinctive identity in a way that matters both unconsciously to oneself and either consciously or unconsciously to others. Speaking for myself, I like it this way. 
I do not really want to know what it is about me that makes some people like me and presumably makes others dislike me for being the particular person I am. Being too self-conscious about one's character can make one stiff and artificial, just like being self-conscious on the dance floor. Though I hope that I do not have a bad character, and I would want to know if I have flaws and vices that I ought to try to eliminate or reduce, if I could find such things out without finding out everything else, good and neutral, that others see in me as making me the way I am, I would prefer it. Ralph Waldo Emerson seems to have a similar thought. The less a man thinks or knows about his virtues, the better we like him, he wrote. Though this attitude is not universal, the fact that it is intelligible lends support to the idea that our characters, in the sense I'm trying to elucidate, include more than the range of dispositions and attitudes that reflect and express our values, at least if values are identified with those things that we do or would on reflection endorse or judge to be good. Some aspects of our characters reflect attitudes and dispositions that we positively disvalue, and others reveal things about us that we have no opinion about. Thus, I propose that we understand character as consisting in the complex of those dispositions and tendencies that reflect and express our distinctive ways of seeing the world. By substituting our ways of seeing the world for our values, I mean to broaden the set of features that count as aspects of character beyond those things that reveal our evaluative judgments and to de-emphasize the importance of whether the tendencies and dispositions that distinguish us are ones we would endorse. But the phrase is vague and indeed metaphorical, and so as a characterization of character, it needs to be supplemented, explained, and clarified. One point worth mentioning is that a complete description of our way of seeing the world, as I wish this to be understood, would not only include those features of a the world that are salient to a person and in what ways they are salient, it would also include what or make evident what features are not salient. Such absences can be of particular interest when they depart from the ways most people see the world, especially if one thinks there's something particularly good or bad about this lack. Thus, for example, inconsiderateness or thoughtlessness can be aspects of someone's character most naturally understood in terms of someone's failure to see other people's needs or sensitivities. A certain kind of selflessness might consist in the fact that in certain sorts of circumstances, a person does not give much attention to her own welfare when deliberating about what to do. In addition, it should be clear that one's way of seeing the world does not refer to the mere literal exercise of one's sense organs and that the world referred to is not restricted to the spatio-temporal physical world. If a person literally sees the world in black and white because his rods and cones are damaged, this tells us nothing about his character. But it is a part of someone's character that he sees the world in black and white in the metaphorical sense, which refers not just to his tendency to classify people and objects as either wholly good or bad, beautiful or ugly, for us or against us, but also to his approach and assessment of policies, principles, and ideas. Indeed, although I have objected to identifying a person's character with the dispositions and tendencies that reflect the person's values as too narrow to embrace all that we typically include in the idea of character, that de definition is on the right track in focusing not so much on what the person sees, but on the way he sees it, on what he sees it as, in a way that marks different objects and ideas in evaluative, effective, and conative ways. To value or disvalue something is at least in part to see it as relatively good or bad, worthy or unworthy. As a person goes through life, encountering people, places, and objects, confronted by challenges, making judgments and choices, her values have much to do with the way she sees and responds to the world. But she also sees things, both actual and possible, three-dimensional and con conceptual, as more or less attractive or repellent, interesting or boring, amusing, surprising, chilling, and so on. Like values, these ways of seeing structure and light up the world of her thought in variegated ways. 
and it is the unconscious, largely integrated complex of these ways of seeing, thinking, and feeling that express themselves in fairly deep set and stable dispositions and tendencies that comprise what I am calling one's character. Thinking again of the racist, who neither approves of racism nor recognizes it in herself, we can see how the broader, if vaguer and less precise characterization of character helps us explain how racism can be a part of her character without it being a part of her values. It's because of something about the way she sees people of different races and which is reflected in her reactions to them that she is a racist, whether she wants to be this way or knows she is this way or not. Thinking again of the unselfconscious proto-philosopher and his philosophical turn of mind also illustrates and confirms the aptness of this broader characterization. For there's nothing about the example, as I've described it, that warrants the conclusion that he, the individual does or would see anything good about the fact that he finds himself interested in such fundamental questions as the objectivity of values or the meaning of life. As I said before, he may not notice that he has this tendency, and if he does notice, he might just shrug it off with the thought, this is just how I am. Indeed, depending on his social environment, he may find this feature of himself embarrassing and regrettable. The philosophers in the audience might think back on how they felt about themselves in high school. But the fact that certain kinds of events lead him to ask certain kinds of questions, that he's drawn to certain kinds of books and movies and conversations, that his imagination follows certain paths and not others, are symptoms of a deep-seated and stable tendency that tells us something important about him, important at least to people with whom he is or might be in a close personal relationship. That is, it tells us something about his character, as I'm using that term, something that I want to include in the admittedly imprecise but suggestive phrase, his way of seeing the world. A difference between the def definition of character I've rejected and the one that I'm proposing that hasn't yet been emphasized is the change from understanding character to refer to a set of dispositions and tendencies to understanding it as a complex of dispositions and tendencies. The first characterization suggests that one's character consists in some or all of one's character traits, which at first glance might appear plausible and unsurprising. But talk of a complex of dispositions and tendency seems to refer to something more integrated or unified. This unification seems almost required by the shift from a description of character in terms of values to one that reflects how an individual sees the world. For while it's perfectly natural and straightforward to speak of a person's values and the dispositions or character traits that express them one at a time, it's awkward and peculiar to divide one's way of seeing the world into separable components. The unity of consciousness that characterizes people of moderately good mental health is such that their evaluative, affective, and conative dispositions interact and blend in ways that seem to yield a single perspective or point of view. I don't mean that people's ways of seeing the world are necessarily rationally coherent or even consistent. A person may be attracted to something that she does not value, bored by something in which she thinks she ought to take an interest. Nor do I mean to suggest that people's points of view and their characters cannot change over time. People can grow cynical or get religion or become more or less politically conservative over time. But even rationally incoherent thoughts and feelings can contribute to a single perspective which might be reflected in elements of ambivalence and confusion that are part of the person's way of seeing the world. Once the shift from conceiving of character as a collection of traits to understanding it more holistically has been made, it seems an improvement. For while honesty is presumably a character trait and an aspect of someone's character, a person who is honest and tactful is honest in a different way than one who is honest and tactless. Her honesty is shaped in part by her tact, or lack of it, as it is by other aspects of her character, such as, for example, an attention to detail. Perhaps this is why it can seem so difficult to describe the people we love in a way that could explain to someone else what it is that makes us love her, and why it's hard to imagine two people with exactly the same character 
even though there's nothing about the idea of character that makes it conceptually impossible. When we reflect on the characters of people we know, or of what we mean when we refer to their characters, it seems that no list of traits, however large, will fully capture who they are. Thus it appears that a person's character is more than or other than a collection of traits. Understanding character as a complex of dispositions and tendencies that reflect a, way, a person's way of seeing the world implicitly seems to accommodate this point in a way that the earlier characterization that I considered does not. Still, the characterization of character I've proposed remains too vague to ward off certain interpretations of what it is to have a character that I want to reject. For presumably, non-human animals, as well as people, might have distinctive ways of seeing the world, reflected in a complex of dispositions and tendencies. And yet, I do not believe that non-human animals, or at least most of them, have characters of the kind that matter so much to us in interpersonal relations. Furthermore, mental disorders, phobias, obsessions, and addictions, for example, presumably figure into the ways those who have them see the world just as much as do values and tastes. But as I've already mentioned, we do not regard these as aspects of the person's character. So we need to add something to our understanding of character that will rule these interpretations out. It might be noted that the characterization of character that I rejected, which associates character with the dispositions and tendencies that reflect an individual's values, avoids these problems. For presumably, non-human animals do not have values. Although they are attracted to some things and averse to others, they cannot judge them as more or less worthy of attraction. And mental disorders do not, as a rule, indicate anything about their victim's values. Famously, being addicted to a drug does not imply that you value either the drug or your consumption of it. Having a compulsion to steal is compatible with strongly disapproving of theft. By broadening the definition of character in a way that weakened the association of character with the reflection of an individual's values, something important to what we mean by character seems to have been lost. But what exactly? It cannot be the connection to value itself if we want to retain and vindicate the intuition that such traits as racism or snobbery can be aspects of a person's character, even if the person doesn't value these things or value anything else that is specifically implied by these traits. But the following thought experiment might suggest something implicit in our thought that at is at least contingently related to valuing. Imagine a dog that has been conditioned to respond differently to people according to the color of their skin. It's trained, let's imagine, to growl and even act aggressively towards dark-skinned people, but not light-skinned people. Is the dog racist? Although its behavior is clearly discriminatory, it seems to me highly misleading to use that term. And yet, if we think that people who discriminate in such a way may be racist, even if they don't endorse racism or value light skin, it cannot be the difference between valuing and not valuing that explains our different responses. Intuitively, it seems wrong to consider the dog racist because the dog is incapable of understanding what racism is. Although it can be trained, that is conditioned, to respond differently to people with different skin tones, its behavior cannot mean what it means when human beings exhibit racist tendencies. The dog cannot understand the very idea of race or form the thought that some people are inferior to others, nor, a fortiori, can it consider whether and why such a thought would be wrong. By contrast, if a person living in 21st century America has dispositions to react differently to blacks and to whites, it's reasonable to assume that she does see blacks and whites as belonging to different races, that she sees them as correspondingly different in objectionable ways, and that she has the mental capacities to question these dispositions, both morally and descriptively. I don't mean to insist that such a person has control over these dispositions, certainly not that she can change them at will. Whether she is accountable and blameworthy for her racism, and if so, how blameworthy she is, are further questions, the answer to which may depend on additional facts. The present point 
is simply that the judgment that an individual is racist, where this is understood to refer to an aspect of an individual's character, involves more than the observation that she has a psychological disposition to react differently to people of different skin tones. It involves an assumption that the disposition in question reflects a certain kind of understanding that gives the disposition the meaning it has. Some philosophers might want to paraphrase this point by saying that a, dispo a disposition can only be racist if it is reasons responsive. And indeed, Peter Goldie has suggested that reasons responsiveness is a criterion of aspects of character quite generally. They might claim that the difference between a dog's being trained to respond differently to individuals with different skin tones and a child's being taught to do this is that the dog's behavior is merely a product of operant conditioning while the child is given reasons. Similarly, they might note that mental disorders are notoriously not responsive to reasons. If a person has a phobia, for example, her fear will not be responsive to the knowledge that the object of her fear poses no danger. If a person is a literally pathological liar, then her disposition to lie will not be sensitive to whether lying is apt to bring her benefit or harm. Thus, they might say, the feature of reason's responsiveness explains the difference between dispositions that are part of one's character and those, like mental disorders, that are not. But the philosophical terminology of reason's responsiveness is ambiguous and potentially misleading. Understood one way, it's not clear why traits acquired by operant, that is, Pavlovian conditioning, would not be considered reason's responsiveness. For if a dog is rewarded for treating blacks and whites differently, doesn't that count as a reason to do so? And if new training rewards him for reversing or modifying these behavior patterns, isn't the dog responding to reasons to change? If, on the other hand, reasons responsiveness is defined so as definitively to exclude such conditioning, then it becomes unclear why the sort of unconscious and unintentional racism we've been talking about should be considered reasons responsive. For the sorts of thoughts and patterns that tend to constitute racism and sexism of this sort are typically not taught explicitly through the offering of reasons by parents, teachers, and pairs, and peers. They are rather picked up, absorbed from our cultures in subtle, subliminal ways. Moreover, as we have already emphasized, such thoughts and patterns are not readily susceptible to change, either as a result of our better judgment or of our will. Nonetheless, there is a difference between what the dog's conditioned behavior shows us about the dog and what the human being's acculturated responses show us about her. And so far as the suggestion to regard reason's responsiveness as a criterion of character is meant to capture these differences, it's on a right track. The acculturated racist, I want to say, has acquired a way of seeing blacks and whites that is different from what the dog has acquired. There is a kind of understanding, albeit bad understanding or misunderstanding, manifest in the responses of the racist that is absent in the dog. And although the acculturated racist may neither endorse her dispositions to discriminate, nor be able directly and immediately to control them, she is at least in principle capable of changing with respect to them over time as a result of coming to understand and appreciate the significance of race differently from what her dispositions currently reflect. I shall put this by saying that the racist dispositions are infused and informed by an active intelligence. That they are infused with intelligence is meant to specify that they are shaped by and reflect understandings of race that involve concepts and content she has come to acquire through a combination of thought and experience. That they are informed by an active intelligence is meant to add that these dispositions are subject to continued change by further thought and new experience, as well as by the gradual effects over time of thought and experience already present and past. It's worth stressing that thought includes not only the exercise of reason, but also that of perception, imagination, empathy, and whatever other faculties contribute to our understanding and appreciation of the world around us. In arguing for the relevance of active intelligence in determining whether a disposition or trait is an aspect of character, 
I've used the contrast between the acculturated racist and the dog in order to avoid the tendency to think that the relevant difference between aspects of character and other psychological traits is essentially related to whether or not the agent values or endorses the dispositions and judgments at issue. But when we turn our attention to dispositions and traits that are endorsed by their agents and to patterns of judgments, desires, and responses that on standard accounts would be regarded as constituting an individual's values, the relevance of active intelligence in differentiating aspects of a person's character from other features of her psychology remains. Consider, for example, the difference between a man whom we would intuitively describe as possessing the virtue of honesty and one who, perhaps as a result of brainwashing or um, a, a pathological desire to please his father, has acquired a strong disposition to tell the truth. Let us assume that the second man, as well as the first, approves of this feature of his psychology. Both have not only the desire to tell the truth, but a second order desire that the first order desire be effective. Both not only want to tell the truth, but also judge that truth telling is good. But the first person must have some, not necessarily articulate, understanding or appreciation of why truth telling is good that will give contours to his value in truth and truth telling that the second will not have. So that the honest person, that is the one who has the virtue of honesty, will not be moved by his value in truth to reveal to his father-in-law that a surprise party is being planned for him that evening much less to direct the Nazi at the door to the Jewish neighbor hiding in his attic. On some, perhaps most philosophical accounts of what it is to value something and of what counts as an aspect of character, both men would qualify as valuing truth and as having honest characters. I prefer to describe them differently and to say of the second man that he has at best a feature that simulates honesty. This is what I had in mind when I said in my comments about an earlier proposal about how to define character, that it was not just too narrow, but insufficiently specific. I hope it is clear that to anyone involved or potentially involved with these individuals in a close personal relationship, there's an enormous difference between them of more than instrumental importance. To sum up, I've proposed a definition of character as the complex of dispositions and traits that reflect and express an individual's way of seeing the world. A definition that is meant to answer to a sense of character that takes one's character to be closely related to one's core identity, sometimes referred to as one's real or deep self. According to this definition, one's character is not restricted to the reflection of interests and dispositions that one does or would endorse. It is rather distinguished by its constituting a response to the world that involves the exercise of an act of intelligence, where the concept of intelligence itself is not to be understood as equivalent to reason and rationality. It's worth noting that one who accepts this definition and takes it to heart is apt to give a less central place to the role of intentions and the role of intentions and of will than current philosophical theories do in their conception of what is important about people. For although one's character, as I have defined it, both shapes and is shaped by one's will in important ways, there's also much that is not intentional or voluntary that is significant in determining one's character. And there are many ways in which one's character reveals itself other than through one's intentional acts. In developing the conception of character that I have, and in trying to make it plausible to you, I've tried to bring out the extent to which our intuitive and pre-reflective thoughts and responses to ourselves and each other include non-intentional, non-voluntary, and non-endorsed features of our outlooks and dispositions in our sense of our identities in actual practice. We sometimes do acknowledge that there are deep aspects of our psychologies that we didn't and wouldn't choose and that are not under our control. And perhaps more often, we take seriously aspects of other people's psychologies that they did not choose and may not even recognize. When we talk of someone's character, I believe, we often implicitly invoke a concept that includes such features, even if we are not self-conscious about it, 
And despite the fact that philosophical accounts of character that may initially appear attractive often exclude such features from their analyses. But more importantly, I've wanted to present an outlook in which our taking such features of ourselves seriously as features of our identities which are appropriate bases for admiration and criticism, pride and shame, love, friendship, and hostility is not just familiar but appealing or, to put it more bluntly, right and good. That is to say, my main concern is to make not a linguistic but an evaluative point. However one chooses to use the term character, there is good reason to acknowledge and take responsibility for such features of ourselves, for our ways of seeing the world, and for the ways our outlooks show themselves in practice, whether or not we approve of these features, and whether or not they are under our control. And there's good reason, too, to care about these features of others, particularly of others with whom we do or may frequently interact, or with whom we do or may have close and intimate relationships. The fact that a person values or chooses or endorses some aspect of herself, or that she intends and approves of something she has done, does and should make some difference to us, at least in contexts in which our feelings and judgments about her are at stake. But it often does, and I believe should, make less difference, both a less strong and a less pervasively relevant difference than many common philosophical conceptions of personhood and responsibility suggest. It's important to keep in mind, however, that while my conception of character is broader than some standard accounts, insofar as it includes non-moral as well as moral traits and is not confined to aspects of a person that she endorses or that are under her control, it also specifies the sorts of traits and aspects of a person that contribute to her character in a way that might be said to raise the threshold of what counts as an aspect of character and even of what it takes to have a character at all. I'm referring to the idea that one's way of seeing the world must be informed by and infused with an act of intelligence such that it is continually, though not necessarily controllably, subject to change in light of one's ongoing experience and reflection. Without this condition, the idea that one's identity is not determined or confined by one's will or one's approval might seem to depreciate the significance of one's agency. It might seem that on my account, a person could be programmed to believe or to want certain things or to see the world a certain way. To put it another way, it might seem that a person could have certain beliefs, desires, ways of seeing the world implanted in her, whether by her upbringing or by a mad neuroscientist, and that this would be sufficient to make these states features of her core identity or character in my sense. Such an account seems to allow that a person might be passive with respect to her character or core identity, and it might be thought that it was precisely in order to reject this possibility that philosophers like Harry Frankfurt and Christine Korsgaard have insisted that one's core identity be restricted to features of oneself that one has in some way chosen or embraced. But if the condition, or better, the specification that one's way of looking at things must be informed or infused with an act of intelligence is understood properly, one can see that this interpretation of my account must be rejected. For the exercise of active intelligence is, as its label suggests, active, not passive. One can perhaps conceive of a being with, with active intelligence having a desire or belief implanted in him. One might, for example, be hypnotized or brainwashed or just socially conditioned to like Big Macs, for example, or to believe that women are less rational than men. If the individual is already fully developed, the belief or desire might be fully in line or harmonious with a host of their other beliefs, desires, and attitudes, or it might be quite anomalous or something in between. Whether the implanted state sticks and gets incorporated into the subject's way of seeing the world will depend on how they reflect, imagine, and otherwise respond to it as it clashes or reinforces other aspects of their way of seeing. If the individual is at an earlier stage of development, just coming to form a point of view of their own, the state in question will presumably be less strongly subjected to tests of coherence. It may therefore be more likely to take hold, at least for an initial period, 
and even to contribute to the addition or rejection of further beliefs, desires, and other dispositions. But still, if the subject is one with active intelligence and there is nothing peculiar about the state under consideration, it will not be permanently fixed, impervious to the challenges new experiences and thoughts might pose over time. To describe the subject, whether the already mature or still developing subject as passive with respect to this process is misleading at best. The point can be missed if one identifies agency with the ability and disposition to act and identifies action in turn with the exercise of choice or will. Calling attention to what it is like for an individual to exercise active intelligence, however, should make one question this way of conceiving of agency and its opposite. Thinking and looking, listening, imagining are active states, even though we frequently do not choose or control whether we are engaged in them, nor choose or control what it is that we will think, see, and so on. Yoga instructors are sometimes, yoga instructors sometimes instruct their clients to just let their thoughts float by and pass through their minds. That is, to be passive with respect to their thoughts. But the difficulty of doing this, or for some people, of even understanding what it would mean to do this, brings out the fact that the default way of thinking is not passive. It takes effort to disengage, and in many cases, it may be impossible to do so. Most of the time, I believe, we take it for granted that when we ascribe a thought, desire, or value to a person, that thought, desire, or value is infused with active intelligence. When we describe someone as honest, for example, we assume that she not only has a desire to tell the truth, but some kind of understanding or sense of what is good about truth-telling, about how good it is relative to other values, how it affects people to be dealt with honestly or dishonestly, and how being honest or not affects the quality of one's relationships with other people. And it is reasonable to take this for granted since it is almost always people to whom we are ascribing thoughts, values, and so on, and people are almost always actively intelligent creatures, exercising their faculties of thinking, perceiving, and so on most of their waking lives. But because we take it for granted, we rarely notice it, and our philosophical accounts fail to mention it. Perhaps it is for this reason that the active-passive distinction and the corresponding idea of agency has been conceived as having so much to do with choice or will. The ability and tendency to exercise active intelligence might serve as a basis for a different conception of agency, one that, that is more distinctively human insofar as it distinguishes people's agency from that of many animals and conceivable machines. It seems to me that the possession of active intelligence and of characters that are infused with active intelligence marks the difference between beings whom I relate to with what P.F. Strawson called the participant stance as members of a common interpersonal and human community and others. For while beings who fail to have and exercise the set of faculties and skills that I'm referring to as active intelligence can have preferences and behavioral dispositions, these preferences and dispositions cannot have the meanings they do when they form part of people's characters, in my sense. Such beings may favor certain people, certain works of art, certain forms of activity over others, but they cannot be sexist or non-sexist, have good taste or bad, be virtuous or vicious, in senses which matter to one with whom one might be in a relationship. To invoke Strawson's contrast between the participant attitude and the objective attitude toward other people, one can fight or negotiate with such individuals but one cannot quarrel or reason with them. One can even love such individuals, but not with the kind of love that two adult human beings can sometimes be said to have reciprocally for each other. If we care about having distinctive human relationships, then it's important that we notice whether individuals have characters in my sense. And of course, it's also important what characters they have. Uh-huh. I got it again. <laughs> okay.
That was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Questions? Beer. Yeah. Question for the mic. Yeah. Ah. Uh, Jay, as is traditional. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I reject that. Uh, <laughs> about uh, yeah, uh, okay. Got it. Um, I will. Yes. Please go ahead, Jay. Um, this is just an invitation to you just to say a little bit more about, uh, you know, the, the, way, the way things strike you, the way thing, the, the world seems to you that in, in, the, in the ways that reflect active intelligence. The, the, the example of it the, that, that you came back to a few times toward the end uh, involving honesty, um, you know, you put in terms of, um, you know, once, once having an understanding of why truth-telling is good. I think that was the phrase you used. And that was to, you know, to contrast the truth-teller whose tendency was merely the result of post-hypnotic suggestion and, pre and presumably doesn't involve active thought, right? Um, but, but, the, but the way you're characterizing um, the, the good kind of character constituting trait, it does seem like it's put in terms of you know, evaluative consciousness, some, you know, um, understanding why truth-telling is good. Uh, that sounds a little bit reasons responsive v to me. Um, you know, it seems like if, if, the, if it's a reflection of the tendency that involves active intelligence that you have a conception of what's good, you know, about a, a certain way that you're inclined to behave, um, that inflection is going to inform your understanding of when you have reason to act in that way, and so on. And I totally agree that those things can come apart from your judging that the trait itself that manifests in these forms, ways of apprehending the world, is good. Maybe you don't engage in that kind of higher order reflection at all, but the the tendency itself it seems to manifest in what look like, you know, evaluatively inflected thoughts that connect to a certain way of understanding maybe what, um, uh, what reasons responsiveness might come to. And if, if that's built into the ways, you know, the character traits in your sense shape your understanding of the world, then, then you might think that subsequent experiences and, um, uh, and, you know, things that happen to you and forms of reflection could continue to, you know, to have an influence and to induce change and so as they, insofar as they they lead to modifications in your understanding, for instance, of what's valuable about truth telling. So, so why isn't this just the kind of reasons responsiveness kind of account of the traits that you seem to be rejecting? Um, maybe I um, suggested I was rejecting more than I was. I, it was, I, you know, as I said um, at one point, I think it's insufficiently sp specific to talk about certain things. And, and, and I also said that the idea of reasons responsiveness was on a right track, but it was, I think, too crude to explain the difference between um, a, a way you could be programmed with reasons to, um, to say, OK, I have a reason to, be, to tell the truth from something that I call an, you know, an understanding or appreciation of what's to be said in favor of truth-telling. So I'm not sure we're disagreeing. I just, you know, I wasn't rejecting it so much as wanting to get inside of it more. OK. Uh, Megan? Hi. Thanks so much for your talk. I really appreciated it. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, so in, in the example that you raised about a person who says, I'm not racist, but then expresses a racist belief. To me, that looks like a case where this person is experiencing a kind of psychological disharmony that manifests in a kind of, yeah, it looks like a kind of psychological disharmony that manifests in an action that they, that some part of them might not endorse. I wanted to ask about acratic actions, which Often, it's often thought that acratic actions involve a failure of agency, but on, you know, but on on the picture of agency that you're giving us here, it's not exactly clear to me whether that's still the case or what you might like to say about the agency of an acratic person in those cases. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, 
Good. I ha it's, I haven't thought about that question. Um, my first reaction is a cratic agency is agency. I mean, I, it doesn't seem to me, I mean, it does seem to me what people are acratic about and, um, you know, is often revealing of how they see the world because how they see the world is not just a matter of what they approve of and disapprove of. It's, you know, what they find attractive and unattractive and how, uh, um, so, which, which isn't the same as what's good, what they judge to be good or bad. So, um, yeah, I would just reject that idea that it's, uh, um, is that, is there something else I should say more specifically? I think what you said makes sense to me. And I would also ask, I guess another kind of related question I had was that if agency is related to these expressions of active intelligence, then where does that leave action? Like, is must active intelligence translate into action and by what like what rules, I guess, should we expect it to follow? Um, well, before I answer that, I did think there was something I wanted to say about a cra about a cratic agency. Now, I'm, but now I'm forgetting it because I was trying to listen to the other. So, <laughs> what does this say about me? Um, oh, I, right. Okay, I, I remember what it was. So there, there is a philosophical issue um, about the difference between. Acratic behavior, which uh, is also, uh, you know, called weakness of will, or at least that's what that kind of acratic behavior. Anyway, weakness of will and compulsion. Like a person doesn't think they ought to do it. At some point, they don't want to do it, but they do it. Um, what's the difference between those who are? Well, is there a difference between being compelled to do it—that is, something <laughs> makes them do it—that's not part of themselves, and it is part of themselves, but it's just not a part they endorse. Uh, I mean, it is a it is a puzzling question, but it's always seemed to me clearly there's a difference. <laughs> I do all kinds of things that are weak will, <laughs> and, and that I at least it seems very unlikely to me to think that th that um, I'm compelled to do them. I you know I should have done better. I could have done better. I just didn't do better, um, and so I mean this is a good the the things that are weak willed. I would recall, say, are uh, evidence of agency. The things that are compelled are, are not in the sense it involves an active intelligence, because they're kind of rigid and not, not responsive to active intelligence, as well, right? Um, so that was the, right, so I did want to add that. Now, right, so now your further question was, remind me again, what? It was how so much action. Oh. Oh, it was about how, like, what role action plays in the picture, since it does seem like you know we would want active intelligence to have something to do with how we act, not um, just how we think. Well, active intelligence has, uh, right, is reflected in how we act all the time. I mean, there's, and there's, I mean, there'll be further. There are lots of issues in which, whether you have control, whether you knew what you were doing, whether um, all of those things will be important to various judgments and questions we have about a person and how, you know, including how responsible we hold someone for, you know, for what they do. Um, so it's not that I want to say it's not relevant to anything. I just think the kind of agency that distinguishes distinctively human individuals from flatter their kinds of beings that, that you know, might be able to act. I mean, they they have a kind of reason and a kind of will. Uh, corporations would be an example of this, as well as some some non-human animals. Um, that's not really about whether they can act. It's about whether they have active intelligence. Maybe may we go on just a little longer? I mean, there are so many questions. So, uh, uh, and I, 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 we're actually a little over time already, but I hope we can run until 5.30. Is, is that all right with you? Oh, yeah, sure. Great. OK, uh, Russ. Russ, Russ. Oh. <laughs> um, thanks very much. I wanted to follow up on the animals. So it does seem right that a dog cannot be racist. I mean, dogs can see skin color, but they can't see race, 
with all the cultural baggage. But I think there are other character traits that we more plausibly ascribe to dogs. So we might talk about the timid dog that sees the world as full of danger, or the friendly dog that sees the world as full of potential friends, or something like friends. So I wonder what you want to say about those cases, whether, strictly speaking, the dog is just simulating timidity or friendliness, or whether there are some character traits that plausibly other animals do have, or what you want to say about those cases. Um, I'd want to, it's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, um, I feel in, insufficiently competent to talk about the, really any kind of animal in detail. I don't have a pet. Um, but, um, but overall, I'd, it's really not important to me to say all non-human animals have no active intelligence and have no characters. And dogs are among the ones that are especially good candidates for having characters to some degree. Um, I, my concern is is really just in in emphasizing sort of the difference between active intelligence and a kind of uh, you know stiffer, more rigid ability to say if it you know if it's red, I'll run away from it. If it's uh, you know, or if it's moving quickly, I'll I'll try to eat it. Or um, where I feel like it's too. I mean, there might there is preference, there's action, there's will, but there's not um, something that you can relate to in an interpersonal way. Now, of course, well, I say of course. I don't think you can relate to a dog in a completely interpersonal way. But but the but the kinds of relationships you can have with one kind of animal or with one particular animal are, are quite you know they can get pretty interesting <laughs> and rewarding in ways that involve um, something like character. So I basically just want to say it all depends on the details, and I don't really know the details. So. No? Um, so this comes back to, I think, weakness of will. I mean, so there's a difference between sort of the person who has as the encratic person and the acratic person, and there's a difference between the courageous person and the cowardly person. But it isn't immediately obvious to me that the difference has to be a difference in how they see the world. I mean, it might be that the courageous person and the cowardly person both see the danger and both see the importance of you know, protecting the city or whatever it is. Um, but one has the ability to control their impulses and the other doesn't have the ability to control their impulses. Now, you might say that the ability to control impulses itself constitutes a way of seeing the world, but um, it didn't seem to me sort of obvious that that was the way to, to understand it. So there seemed like there need to be some further element, not just, it's not just a matter of how we see the world, but how we respond to what we see. Uh, yes, I mean, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, I, I mean, there are cases and cases. Different, you know, there are different kinds of expressions of weakness of will. Um, I mean, if they have, if they literally don't have the ability to do something different. I mean, a phobia might paralyze you in certain circumstances, which I don't, I won't include as um, as acrasia, right? Um, but. I do think, well, I guess what I think is some people are um, strong-willed as a kind of, gen, in a gen, you know, they're very good at doing what they set their minds to, and other people are not very good at it. And, that, and I think I agree. Those, it really isn't part of ways of seeing the world. It may be um, right to say it is part of someone's character that, uh, you know, they never follow through or um, and. Um, so I think the right thing to say there is just, I'm not actually giving a complete characterization of character. I'm really just focusing on a big aspect of it that I think gets, um, uh, gets treated too crudely, but 
that it really should be supplemented with something having to do with their ability to carry through on their way of seeing the world. Uh, you. Thanks a lot. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of individuality in your account of character. Um, mm. So on your account, um, character refers, you said, to the complex of dispositions and tendencies that reflect our distinctive ways of seeing the world. And earlier, you know, in giving kind of common sense characterizations of character, you said that it refers to the features that distinguish a person from others in ways that are important to people. And yet, you know, when I reflect on my own character, I'm struck that most aspects of my character are ones that I have in common with many, many other people. And yet, these are aspects of my character that I um, value no less for that being the case. The same is true when I think about the characters of my friends. And indeed, you might think, you know, one of the you know, probably predictable effects of the moral education of children trying to inculcate in them certain character traits like honesty or compassion or considerateness is to, you know, in some important uh, senses, make them probably more like one another in terms of character. Now, given the role that, you know, integration plays in your role, uh, in your account of character, it's of course unlikely that we could have, you know, exact uh, doppelganger in terms of character, though you did say, you know, it's not con conceptually impossible. Um, so given all that, I just wanted to invite you to say a bit more about, you know, the role that individuality is playing on your account of character and, and why, if anything, we should think, uh, think of its value. Ah, well, um... Yeah, good. So uh, the first thing to say uh, is you know, distinctive does not mean unique, right? Um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting there's a, um, that we should focus on, well, what's unique about someone? Um, I think I came into, I mean, my interest in thinking about character was closely connected with my interest in what is it ma that makes me um, want to be friends with some people and not with others that you know um, and so you focus on the differences between the ones you care about uh, you know, that you want to be friends with that you're in right or even just in the differences between the people you are close with and other people <coughs> including the things that you don't like about the people you're close with which um, you know, especially when you're talking about siblings and so on, it's easy to find. So I think, um, you know, a lot of it just reflects those are questions that are of interest to me. Um, and they, you know, tend to concentrate on differences that make you different from somebody else. When you say, well, when I reflect on myself, a lot of, you know, there's more that I have in common with people than what I have different. But all the things you, have in common with most people will not explain, you know, why you have the friends you have, and so, um, rather than, you know, why aren't they friends with anybody else? They're just, you know, they have all the same qualities. Right? Um, so, I mean, the role of individuality. I mean, I'm not sure that there's a role to it. It's just that each person has a character, um, which is because it's a complex that's, an, you know, acquired through um, a specific history of experience and of, um, you know, of temperament and of all of this is going to come out somewhat different and, um, you know, to different people, more or less attractive and so on. So I'm not sure uh, if there's some, some further question. I mean, of course, when you, once you abstract to have character traits, those as I said, you know, there are lots of people who are honest, but they're honest in different ways because of the way it combines with other things, other qualities they have. There are lots, you know, um, you wouldn't, we don't usually think of character traits. I mean, there's some things that maybe almost everyone has. You know, they like to eat, you know, they get hungry after, you know, 10 hours without food or something. That's, that's not a character trait for, for lots of reasons, I think, even though it might have such a, something to do with the way you see the world, at least when it's, you know, 2 o'clock and <laughs> you haven't eaten. Right. Yeah. It's, 
somewhat dementing because we have tons of people wanting to ask questions, but we are 15 minutes over. And I think collective exhaustion is probably going to kick in around the same time. I don't know, what's the mood of the meeting? Would you like to go on for a bit? Or are you thinking, well, that was great, but frankly, I could do with a sherry? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should ask you. Yes, what would you like? Oh, I don't, I, well, I just, I don't want anyone to feel they have to sit any longer, but I, I'm... I can, no, I have... Let's I have, pack it up here. Okay. I think okay. George Holmes Howison would have been delighted. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>